Thanks. Thank you very much, uh, Rajiv. <coughs> Mr. President, faculty, students, there are many reasons why I, uh, I feel deeply honored and privileged to be here today. Um, certainly one of them is because of my friendship and association with, with Rajiv, whom I admire greatly. I admire him not just as a human being, but I, I admire him for his, his commitment to develop his own company and his own lifestyle and the society within which he functions in a manner that is focused on the long term, that is indeed sustainable. A second reason why I feel privileged is, of course, I am from Rajasthan. As Rajiv said, I am from Udaipur. I studied at Mayo, by the way, um, Rajiv, not at Doon. And I have this, I will admit, uh, I think unique distinction of being on the board of Doon School, even though I actually graduated from its arch competitor school, Mayo College. Um, in, I, I, let me boast a little bit more. I am, in fact, uh, the only person who's on the board of both schools. <laughs> I don't know what got into the minds of the board of governors when they invited me to do that, but uh, I enjoy it. Uh, but the fact I am from, that I am from Rajasthan, you know, is, is um, you know, one should not, I, have, I cannot dismiss the, that. I cannot dismiss that coming into Rajasthan and uh, seeing an institution uh, like this uh, is uh, perhaps more, um, gives me more of a thrill than if it were somewhere else. So let me be very frank, uh, this, uh, this, uh, uh, this location, this state, this has a very deep emotional sort of uh, meaning for me. But I think the main reason why, I know the main reason why I feel really privileged to be here is because after I, I recognize that this institution and institutions like this are indeed the institutions that India will need to nurture. These are the institutions that go beyond the ordinary. They go beyond what in the corporate world you could, you could say is business as usual. They ask a, a different question. They ask the question, can we grow? without destroying our inheritance? Can we grow without destroying the lifestyle and, and um, the meaning of future generations? Can we grow sustainably? These institutions are institutions that offer great education, but they go beyond just a focus on the quantitative. They go beyond just teaching you how to read an Excel sheet or to look at a balance sheet. They go beyond the traditional, I think, curricula of institutions that we have all been accustomed to. They actually ask a much wider question. How can an individual enter society and not only meet his own individual aspirations, but also at the same time do something for the society of which he's a member. So for these three reasons, I'm very glad and I'm really appreciative of this invitation. Now, Rajiv did tell me uh, that I should speak, and I should speak from the heart, and, um, and I can speak on whatever subject I wish to. So I have no prepared script, I have no PowerPoint, I have no, I have no sheet of paper. I want to speak in a very free-flowing sort of uh, manner. But I want to talk about uh, the issue of sustainability, but with the focus on the subject that I know best, which is energy. But its energy is indeed a subject that I think lies at the very root of the deepest dilemmas that all of us face. The dilemma, let's say, between poverty and prosperity. The poor, everyone needs energy, but the poor need energy that is affordable, that is accessible. But if you only subsidize energy, then you can 
very quickly lead to a situation where you jeopardize future growth. There's a dilemma between industrialization and the environment. Energy is cru crucial for industrial growth. But as all of you know, in energy is also one of the reasons why the environment is, in such, uh, is under such stress. So energy is indeed one of those subjects that, become, that comes to the forefront whenever we talk about the issue of sustainability. And that's one, why I want to talk about it from that perspective. I don't, I don't want to, I don't think there is any one prescription on the definition of sustainability. I don't think there is any one formula by which people should move ahead on the path to sustainability. But there is one central message, and that message is that man cannot collide with nature and hope to survive indefinitely. Nature is going to lay the bounds and we will have to will work within those boundaries. And that, I think, is a message that all of us have to accept. Now, many of you in this room will be asking the question, or should be asking the question, how is this chairman of a company that basically produces petrol, diesel, kerosene, you know, all those products that, in fact, pollute the environment? Um, and you are very, very right to ask that because one of the most, uh, one, one of the companies, and one, not companies, one of the sectors that has been, that has indeed contributed to environmental degradation is indeed the energy in the petroleum sector. But let me, in the course of my my talk, try and persuade you that not every energy company ignores this subject of sustainability. Let me make three points right, right at the beginning. One is that the demand for energy is growing, is surging, is growing much too fast. The second point is that the supply of energy is not keeping pace with this demand. And the third point is that the environment is under great stress. These three very simple hard truths are central to the subject of sustainability. Because ultimately the question then arises, how do we weaken the link between growth, economic growth, energy demand and environmental degradation? That link has to be weakened. How do we do it? Now, why is demand for energy growing so fast? There are very, essentially two simple reasons. One, the population is growing, and two, people are becoming more prosperous. People are getting richer. A country like India is moving from a stage of, is moving from a period where the energy intensiveness of our growth is becoming more and more intensive. We are, use, we are moving from a, 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 we are moving into a growth trajectory where we are using more energy per capita or more energy per thousand dollars or thousand rupees of GDP growth. And that is one reason why demand for energy is growing very fast. Population, of course, is compounding this. Supply, on the other hand, is simply not keeping pace. Now, there are many different sort of sources of supply of energy. In India, 50% of the people actually access non-commercial sources of energy. So they use biomass, they use firewood, they use cow dung. And the balance, well, about 60% actually use non-commercial. The balance use oil, gas, coal, and a very, very small, very, very small, statistically insignificant number are using what we call renewables. But if you were to take a forward look and go forward, say, 10, 15 years, you, ask, you have to ask the question, where are we going to get the supply that is going to actually meet the demand? There is not enough oil in India, that we know. The demand for oil is increasing at such a rate that our import dependence 
has increased from 35 percent 25 years ago to 80 percent now. In other words, we import 80 percent of our oil. We have a lot of coal in this country, but the coal is dirty. It is quali the quality of coal is poor, and the coal is located in areas that are very far from the consumption centers. So there is a huge requirement of infrastructure to bring the coal from the point of production to the point of consumption. So there is, there is that challenge with coal. We have now been able to find more and more gas. As you may, many of you will have heard about this discovery that Reliance made offshore India, offshore East India. But gas, unlike oil, cannot just be produced and stored. It has to be produced and then piped. And so the infrastructure required to bring the gas to the point of consumption has to be built before you produce the gas. Now that is something we have not done in this country. We have not built enough pipelines to actually link the production points of gas to the consumption points. So even though there are reserves of gas in this country, much, much of it is still not being produced. For instance, in Tripura, in northeast India, ONGC found gas 50 or 40 years ago. It's still under the surface because there is no market in Tripura and there hasn't been enough of a pipeline network created to bring the gas to uh, North India. So oil and gas have a, there's a shortage of oil, there's an infrastructural problem with uh, gas, and there's also an infrastructural problem with coal. You look at the alternatives, you say, well, nuclear, yeah, okay, nuclear it has an option, there is an option of nuclear, it's a clean fuel, but even the government has admitted that nuclear, even the best case scenario, will not account for maybe four to five percent of our total energy basket in 2025, 2030. And if you look at the alternatives, whether it's solar, whether it's bioethanol or biodiesel or whether it is uh, wind, all of these are still relatively expensive. The technology exists, but the technology is more expensive than the alternative. But much more fundamental than the, than the cost is that the infrastructure, again, for bringing these new types of energy to the market has not been created. The infrastructure for bringing wind, for example, power to the market does not exist. So today, Suzlon has put up a lot of turbines, wind turbines in Tamil Nadu, but there is no grid system in Tamil Nadu to bring the electricity to the customer. So, uh, what happens? So the there is a problem here, and that's the reason why supply is not keeping pace. And then you have associated with this the environment, the consequence on environment of this rapid growth of, of the economy, and then this consequential rapid growth of, of energy. And you see that, you see that when you drive even towards your campus, and you see the scars on the hill, in the hill behind your campus that has been created by the people who are quarrying, who are, who are marble or whatever they are quarrying, stones. This uh, area in Udaipur that um, uh, Mr. Pawar Rajiv mentioned is, is unique. The reason it's unique is because in 1930 when my grandfather set up this institute called Vidya Bhavan and in 1930 Udaipur was, if you remember, a very feudal princely state and the ruler of Udaipur in those days didn't particularly worry about the education of the lower middle class. There was schools for the aristocracy and then there was nothing else. And my grandfather was a socialist, you know, in those days. And uh, he basically decided to set up a school first and then he set up many other institutions. Um, but. He also, uh, and, and, the, and, and he also had this land, which is because it belonged to this institution, and be because this institution had, well, had, had the protection, it, it was an institution, it was not private, but it was kind of, uh, in a sense, controlled, it was not government, 
These 400 acres of forests are the only forests left in Udaipur. Uh, and you see all around it just complete, the complete evidence of unplanned, greedy development. So there are marble uh, people who are literally at the edge of this forest, who don't want to encroach on the forest. And you ask yourself, what exactly is happening with our developmental process? And the way I think is now, as, as, as somebody who runs a company but also has um, a deep uh, personal sort of concern about whether individuals like me are doing enough to actually um, leave behind something that my daughters will feel proud of and can be comfortable with. I worry because I am both a practical person and I say there's no way, no point in my actually trying to ask for something that's not going to happen. At the same time, I ask what is it that we can do together to actually change the way that we develop, to change the whole paradigm of development. And that question is what bothers me a lot. I, I ask that question again from the context of my own business. I know that energy is something you cannot do without. I also know that there is no point talking about clean fuel all the time because it is not possible to suddenly shift from oil and gas and coal to nuclear or wind and solar overnight. As I have just explained, you need to create the infrastructure, you need to you know, uh, have a completely different economic system. Our economic system, our industries, our houses, our cars are all run on fossil fuels or mostly run on fossil fuels. There is no easy, for instance, alternative to, to liquids as a transportation fuel. There is none. We talk about CNG, we talk about bioethanol, we talk about biodiesel. But each of these, each of these alternatives has a problem associated with it, which can be overcome, but it won't be overcome overnight. So let us first recognize that energy is critical and that within this energy basket, Fossil fuels are also going to be part of our life for years to come. So the first thing to do is, what can we actually do about greening the fossil fuels? That question is something that we have to ask. That I think is, goes to the core of the whole debate on sustainability. But what is it that we can do to make sure that the fossil fuels we use is indeed something that is not as polluting as it has been for so long. And here, and this is one of the reasons why I am happy to be with Shell and I can stand up and talk about a subject like this. Here you have companies like Shell, very big companies, I mean, you know, Shell is one of the biggest companies in the world, spending billions of dollars on trying to, for instance, refine the technology to convert coal to ultra-clean liquids. Or oh, two months back, we commissioned a plant in Qatar where we take gas and we convert gas into liquids, again diesel, where, from where there is not even 1.001% emission. Now, that kind of technology is something that we have to focus on because that is the one thing that we can do now. And the challenge for all of us who are in some leadership positions within the government or in the industry but have an association with government is how can we persuade the decision makers to adopt such technologies? How can we persuade the decision makers to look beyond their short-term vested interest and actually take a longer-term view? It is a big challenge. It's not easy. All of you, you know, as, as Rajiv said, are all end, going to end up in very important positions. You're all going to be, as, uh, whether it's in industry or academics or government or on your own, but I'll tell you one thing, 
from the example that I'm giving just now, that you will not be able to solve some of these problems unless you collaborate with each other. Collaboration is going to become the biggest, biggest, is going to be the need of the day. If indeed tomorrow we want to introduce a technology like coal gasification, it requires many different government ministries to come together. It requires state governments to work with central government. It requires the civil society to accept that there's going to be a shift in the way they operate. So the miners, the coal miners, it will require collaboration. So technology, the, all of us who talk about technology, and I know one of your four sort of central messages in this school for the university is all about technology. Technology is going to give you the answer, but technology cannot be provide the, the sufficient answer. It will provide a, ne it's a necessary prerequisite. It does not actually provide the sufficient, it does not meet the sufficient condition. The sufficiency condition requires that technology be used, deployed in a manner that addresses the demands of society. And that means that you have to actually get technology as an enabler to bring society together. Now that's one way, for example, that I feel we have to look at the whole aspect of, of sustainability. That here you have an answer through technology of let's say greening fossil fuels. But you can't green fossil fuels unless you actually get society to work together, different elements of society to work together. Now I, I actually, you know, think go beyond that. It's not just a question of these big companies doing R&D in their own laboratories. It's a question also of these big companies and small companies taking a very different view of what is their role in society and what should be their role as, as part of society. You see, we all have been given the license to operate. The question really is, you know, will we continue to be given the license to grow. And I think the license to grow for large companies or any company will only come if all the stakeholders are indeed, ex do indeed accept that the principles underlying the values of that company are indeed sustainable. CSR, this idea of CSR now has entered the vocabulary of every single company. But CSR, what does it really mean? Does it really mean that if I gave you a check, if I gave, if, if uh, NIIT just gave a check that they fulfill their obligation towards society? I can tell you that giving a check is a very, is not difficult. If you have spare cash, you give a check, you can, you know, you can meet and you can feel maybe that you've done something for society. But today, I think we have to go beyond that kind of philanthropy. We have to recognize that CSR, or call it whatever you will, has to be modeled very much along the lines, I think, that Rajiv has modeled this university. That this is, that it is a, it, it's, a, it's a model where a company partners other members of society in a way that brings the strength of each of the partners onto the table so that one plus one adds up to more than two. Consider, for example, if you were to create a joint venture which had the following partnerships. On one hand, as corporate partners, you had, and I'm just thinking on the top of my head, and it is not a reflection on any one company, but let's just say, NIIT to provide technical solutions. Uh, Rand Baxi to provide medical support. Um, Hindustan Levers to provide the distribution network. Uh, Reliance to bring their project management skills. So you have, let's say, 50% of that joint venture is owned by these four companies. Each of them providing very distinct but distinct, uh, or very, bringing very distinct strengths to the table. Then 25% of the company is owned by, let's say, the local area in which this company is operating. Take a, 
take uh, this whole area, this village or this, these a cluster of villages which needs development. And the balance 25 percent, let's say again, is owned by the government. Okay. Now, because government is important, they have to. They are. This, they are of course, you can't. You know, they're they're the principal custodians of development. And the focus of this joint venture is to develop this area, this village, in such a way that you end up creating income generating opportunities for the villagers, for the community, yeah, on a sustainable basis. Now, that sort of a, a partnership makes sense to me. As, and it makes sense to me from the perspective of a corporate. Why? Because the corporate is not only bringing its money, but it's also bringing its management skill or project management skill or its technological skill or its medical uh, capabilities. It's bringing more than just money. And that, I think, has become now crucial. We in the corporate world, when we talk of sustainability, we have to talk about how can we actually bring to the table something that goes beyond the easy way to do things, which is money. I can say that in India, for instance, Shell, and I don't like to, you know, sort of trumpet uh, Shell in public like this, but I'm very proud of one thing, so I will say it. Uh, and, um, and, but to illustrate what this, you know, to give you concrete, concrete, uh, concrete illustration of what I've just said. Um, we have uh, three, we created three companies in India after some time. One is focused on clean stoves. Now this company is a company which now sells, it's the largest selling clean stoves company. I think it's sold 250,000 stove, clean stoves in India and one of the largest in the world. It does not bear the Shell name by the way, okay. This company is called EnviroFit. There's nothing, you won't find the Shell logo, you won't find uh, uh, anything, you won't find my name, nothing. It is, however, totally supported, funded, etc. by Shell. Now, how did this happen? And what was the concept behind it? The concept, the, it happened when Shell decided many years ago that indoor air pollution was arguably the, one of the worst uh, problems, medical problems that we are facing in this country. Half a million people die in India every year through respiratory illness because they're cooking food inside their huts and they're breathing this, this air. Half a million people. So we don't, have any, we don't know the technology of how to make cooking stoves. So we tied up with a local NGO that had developed the technology. And we then also tied up with, we brought in, we, we identified a village or villages and we brought in the villages as the, as the third partner. So we had a partnership shell, which brought money, management expertise, you know, uh, its, its ability to help them market the product. We had this NGO from Pune, which had the technology, and we had the local villagers who basically know the community, they knew the area, and they were also going to actually market the, the product and generate the income for themselves. Now this pilot worked, so that's when it worked, we decided that look, we can't do any charity here. People will, people will be enthused if they actually have to work uh, on a commercial basis. The mindset must go from the poor being just the beneficiary of a handout, you know, just the beneficiary of a check, to the poor being a consumer and an entrepreneur. You have to see it as a consumer and an entrepreneur. So this company was set up. And again, the same group of people, but this time, Shell decided not to be the shareholder because the, we are not there to make money. Okay, so the shareholders are the villagers. The shareholders are, is, this, is this company that has the technology. And we had to change the company because the technology had to be refined. So now this company is running on a self-sustaining, profitable basis it is, it is, it has now got technology from places like the Berkeley, uh, Berkeley uh, uh, Laboratory in, uh, in, in, uh, in uh, California and, but the price point is such that it is affordable, the people are buying, it is safe and it is clean. 
We did a similar, not a similar, we did a very different project in Gujarat. This was done initially in Maharashtra, as now the whole area of focus is South India. But uh, our aim is to sell, uh, and we are taking it, by the way, this model may go international, so in which case we will sell about uh, five million stoves in five years' time. But in India, we want to sell a million, million stoves in uh, two years' time. Who knows? But we are, we are well on track. We have another, uh, another project, which again, similar concept, no shell branding, no this thing, where we took, we identified farmers in Kutch. These are farmers uh, who are growing cotton through organic, you know, organic cotton farmers. Now the problem, as all of you know, for many of these very, very poor farmers, is that they actually are unable to find a market for their product. They have to go, they have to sell it to an intermediary. And that intermediary, the, you know, is the person who makes all the money. He takes up, takes away all the margin. And so, how do you bypass this intermediary? Now, Shell basically has two strengths. One is it's international, so it has a very strong network of international connections. And of course, it has money and it has man management skill. And I keep repeating, money is the least of the issues here. <laughs> okay. What, end, end, what did we end up doing? We ended up basically introducing these farmers to retailers like Marks and Spencers, Cotton, uh, CNA, another very major retailer of, of Europe. Today, and so we, it was a great success, we've now created a company called Cotton Connect. And today, all of these people who are part of the Cotton Connect, uh, 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 you might say, family, are selling directly to uh, to these um, um, uh, to these large international uh, retailers. In this is in Gujarat. In Bihar, uh, four people like you, literally. I'm not joking. They were all out of. There were three of them were out of IIT or somewhere young, 22 year, 23 year. They came to us. They had an idea of converting rice rice uh, husk into power, but they had no money. So we gave them the money, and today they are—they have electrified 70 villages. Now this is still in the pilot phase. Huh? The Cotton Connect and uh, Envirofit went from pilot to something commercial. Husk Power is now moving slowly in that direction. We no longer need to fund these youngsters because they are actually selling their electricity. Uh, for a sufficient tariff to be able to expand, but we needed to help them to actually make that breakthrough. So the point I'm trying to make, uh, uh, friends, is, is very simple. That sustainability for me, for, for me not, as I say, just as a company, but as an individual, is not just simply about money. It is, not, it, it, it is to recognize, as uh, Rajiv was saying, the seamlessness of our of our lifestyle, of our, of our existence. We can no longer ignore that nature, as I said, binds us. We are bound to nature. Nature is part of us. If we try and challenge nature, we are not going to be able to succeed. But we need to be part and parcel of a process of, of living whereby we actually give and we receive. And we, not, we do not convert everything into dollars and cents or rupees and so on. We convert it in a way that brings both money, which is necessary, as I said, but also conviction and a sense of belief. And this, what you see here, what I see here, what you've in this, uh, this campus is all about that, I feel. It's all about the belief that we can actually create something that is different, that is sustainable. That if we can make people who come into this school or come into schools like this believe that at the end of the day, at the end of four years, they go out there, they have to earn a living, let's not be unrealistic, you have to get jobs, you have to actually, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, meet your own individual aspirations for growth. But if you have inculcated in yourself the value that your growth, your personal growth cannot come at the expense of some larger uh, issue, like, as I said, the sustainability of development, then I think we're going to actually be able to move away from this current trajectory of rampant materialism
towards something that is far more sensible. That is the key. And that is my own idea of sustainability. And that's why I believe that whether you work for an energy company, which prima facie is a critical prerequisite for development, whether you work for uh, your own, uh, uh, your, for yourself as an entrepreneur, whether you work as an IT company, it is all, in fact, actually interdependent. You are dependent on me, I'm dependent on you. There's a seamlessness in that relationship. And I think that is what I, what I find so appealing about the basic concept underlying the, uh, the theme of this, uh, of this university. Um, I think um, uh, I'm going to stop here, Rajiv, if, if I may, and uh, leave uh, the sort of perhaps uh, offer all of you an opportunity to, to, to ask questions, yeah, if it's okay. So any questions from any of you? Yeah, please. My, oh, my goodness. This is, this is the, the problem of being in a university. They're, normally, you know, people hesitate. <laughs> they have five hands raised. I'm very glad. <laughs> Sir, hello, sir. <clears throat> I got two questions for you. Uh, sir, you talked about uh, the energy consumption in India in the beginning. As you know, a lot of energy that is there in India is subsidized. But what I feel the model of subsidy is not working here. Like, I don't want to pay my taxes so that my neighbor can drive his BMW at a, at a right. lesser cost. So, uh, what, according to you, should be the model? Like, should we follow the Iranian model where the money that is actually spent on subsidies directly given to the needy people and the subsidies on the fuel is completely taken away? Or should we continue with what we are doing now? And the second question I had was on sustainability, as you said. You gave the example of the land that your grandfather owned and the marble quarries around. Uh, so don't you think stopping those marble quarries would be you know, completely wrong? Because there are two parts to it. There's a greed and there's a need. There would be the greed of the people, of the owners of those quarries, and there would be the need of the people who are dependent on that. So instead of stopping them outright, shouldn't we come out with a business model which you just proposed, should be, which should be self-sufficient, which will ensure that those people have livelihood and not charity from, from you know, corporates like us. So we set up a model wherein they can work, they can earn without hurting the nature. Yeah, no, I think both, both questions, thank you very much, uh, uh, important questions. Uh, this, for, let me answer the second question first because I think that's uh, um, the more important one, if I may. And this, your question really gets to the heart of the whole issue of, develop, as I said, the dilemma of prosperity or industrialization versus growth, you know, or let's say industrialization versus sustainability. Uh, the marble, you know, you can talk about anything. In, we, we do need to industrialize. We do need to invest in marble plants or, or manufacturing plants. We can't just, um, I mean, Jeram Ramesh, who was the former environment minister, uh, uh, certainly upset a lot of industrialists because he just came out with a very blanket statement saying this is a go area and it's a no go area. You know, some areas were where you could invest and others were just not going to be open to any form of investment. Now, I'm not, I, I didn't agree with that myself because I feel that this is not, there's no black and white uh, situation here. You can't just draw, draw a line and say, you know, development has to be, um, uh, or growth has to be sacrificed because of environment. My, my whole approach now is that, there is, that these trade-offs that we talk about, they're not trade-offs. You can indeed establish a balance. There is a way of establishing a balance between man and nature, between growth and, 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 uh, and, and the ecology, you might say, between the individual's need for for, for income and society's need for, let's say, a safe or environmentally clean place. Now, take, if you were to go to Udaipur and you were to see these marble quarry owners and say, you'd say, okay, do, you don't stop, but let's make sure that what you do, you manage to do within certain standards of, you know, which, which meet the st requirements of the area within which you're operating. You have to accept those standards. Now, those standards could be standards of safety. It could be standards that uh, accept that maybe you have to, uh, you, can't, you can't indeed expand your uh, quarry uh, just, you know, wherever you want. That there is indeed a kind of a relationship between you and, and uh, that forest that exists. So I'm saying every situation has to be actually addressed in a, in a very specific way. But there is no black and white. 
There are these are the dilemmas that society has to has to resolve, and that's why I think this whole issue of of uh, energy becomes so important. On the first question, you know, I again I agree with you. So subsidies are not a good thing. Subsidies distort the market. Subsidies lead to adulteration. Sub adulteration leads to environmental pollution. Today, people uh, put kerosene into diesel, okay, because of the price differential. Uh, they put naphtha into petrol. So there is a huge amount of uh, distortion in the market. People who are rich actually end up getting the subsidized product. All of us end up taking the LPG cylinders at subsidized rates. And I can tell you that I have a house in the mountains in, uh, in Uttarachal, and uh, the villagers there don't have a single cylinder of, 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 uh, of LPG. They don't, they're not able to get one single liter of kerosene on the, on the, on the from the ration cards, they have to buy it in the black market. So subsidies are not working. But, so what do we do? There are many answers to that. And the Planning Commission is looking at one, which is to use smart cards. So when, you, when Nandan Nilekani finalizes his UID project, it will become easier to identify the people who actually need the subsidy and perhaps direct the subsidy to them. But it's a big political issue. The problem in our country, unfortunately, is that good rational economic logic sometimes is not allowed to uh, uh, is not allowed uh, to uh, uh, the, to define policy uh, because of populist politics. And subsidies is just one very good example of where uh, uh, you might say good politics uh, um, takes over. Or, or good politics wins from good economics. Okay, if you see what I mean. Because the politicians think that this is the only way they're going to get votes. So I agree with you, it's a big challenge. Someone was there. So, the question I wanted to ask is that this whole uh, discussion is on sustainability. Uh, number one, if the company like Shell is investing uh, such a huge amount of money, uh, coal probably in uh, 10, 20, 30 years would probably not be there. On and uh, secondly, instead of investing billions of dollars into this side of development, why does it the company invest more on uh, developing the infrastructure that you were talking of earlier of you know building pipelines or probably grid lines to uh, you know the the gas uh, and the you know wind energy to the end customer rather than investing on something which will probably perish in the next 30 years well i mean uh, firstly i don't see why uh, the results of this technological breakthrough is going to perish. Um, as I said earlier, the likelihood of fossil fuels, which is coal, oil, and gas, remaining part of the energy basket uh, is uh, for many years, for many decades to come, is very is high. I mean, even in 2050, uh, oil, co oil, coal, and gas will probably account for 50 percent of our total energy consumption. So. The question really is, how do we green, as I said earlier, that particular component of the energy basket? And so this technology goes towards that particular uh, uh, problem. Uh, so it doesn't perish. Um, it's very important. Your other part of the question, of course, is that a company, every company has a particular focus. I mean, uh, Shell is an energy company uh, with uh, focus on exploration and production of oil and gas and marketing of oil and gas. Okay? It is not invested in, uh, in, um, in nuclear. It is now moving very strongly towards renewables, so it has invested in bio and wind, and it is the largest, by the way, uh, generator of wind in the world. It's the largest distributor of bio in the world. So it is doing that. But it is not in the business of building pipelines or ports or or all of that. There are other companies that do that, okay? Um, what it is certainly uh, capable of doing is partnering with these other companies 
and ensuring that the, that the environment within which uh, these investments are going to take place is, is, uh, uh, is positive. So it, provide, it can be a partner. It is in some cases a partner in an oil, in a, in a, um, in a pipeline company. Uh, we have, for example, uh, uh, a big, big terminal in Gujarat, and uh, uh, which imports gas, it liquefies gas, and then it sells gas to customers. At the time, many years ago, when we acquired the license, the government insisted that we also build uh, a solid cargo facility, a, a, cargo, a port which will allow us to import you know, coal and solid cargo. Now, that's not our business. So we told them we will do it, but we will also have to sell it because we can't run that kind of business. We're not in that business, so we've now sold it. So the point is we helped create the basic uh, platform and today there is a company called Adani which is in that business which is building a big port. Okay? So we will, all these big companies are, should be focused on doing what they know best. And, but again, my central point that you cannot work within your own silo. We are inter interdependent now. Everyone, we have to now look beyond our core competence and see how best we can bring in other companies, other partners, and start to resolve or address the issues that, that, we, that has been the subject of this, this, uh, this talk today. Good afternoon, sir. So how can companies encourage uh, and attract and retain and incent employees uh, to drive sustainability? I think the uh, first thing is that the company's values, corporate values, must actually uh, be aligned with the values of the individual employee. It's easier said than done, but there are many of us who work for companies who don't feel that the company that we work for actually is, uh, is doing the right thing. We work for them maybe because we need a job. If we work for a company where we just do it because of money or because we need a job, we are not committed to that company, we are not involved in that company, we are not passionate about that company or what it's doing, eventually we will leave. So the first thing is if we have a value system, if the company's corporate culture is really in line with your corporate culture, I think that uh, you will have a, a very loyal and a long-term employee. Now here, if you worked for us, let's say, if any of you worked for us or you worked for NIIT or something, there would be no doubt in your mind, I'm sure, after literally days in the company, that this company actually believes in the principles that I've been talking about. It walks the talk. Yeah. And you'd feel comfortable about it. One of the things I'm really, I, I'm telling you, I say it in public and I'm proud of, I was chairman of Shell uh, from the day it started in India. And today it's probably the largest energy multinational in India. Not one rupee has been paid to a single person ever in India. We have lost business, I will admit that. We have had many, many of our approvals have got delayed. I'll admit that. I've had many people ask me, not one, not two, many, from very senior people to junior people. I mean, I'll give you one very simple example. We put up a petrol pump in Chennai, and uh, within two days of the petrol pump being inaugurated, a petrol pump cost us $700,000 to build, you know, a Shell petrol pump. We're the only international company that has the license for the petrol pumps. A superintendent engineer came and asked for 10,000 rupees for whatever, he made some, said your plans are wrong, we refused to give it to him. Next day he brought one of these, uh, whatever, you know, these, uh, these tr things that dig up uh, the, the land, and he dug up the forecourt, not inside our, our property, just outside our property, so that no car could enter. It took me one year, one year, to restart that pump. And do you know how I had, uh, finally got it restarted? By going to the, it had to go from literally the lo lowest level people in Chennai all the way to the Central Cabinet Minister Union of India. Because at that time, the Union Cabinet Minister uh, in Delhi 
was also from the DMK, which was running, uh, running Chennai. 10,000 rupees. But I am telling you now that no one asked me for money after that in Chennai. Or not yet, anyway. I shouldn't know. Maybe they will start asking. <laughs> but no one has. Now, you as my, let's say, a colleague in, uh, in the company will see it. You will see it, you will believe it, and you will feel comfortable with working in a company like that. Now, you may not get paid the same money that you might get paid somewhere else, but I think you will stay with us because of that. Sir, at one point of time in your speech, uh, you said that at times we need to persuade the government to take certain decisions or few things. If I logically deduce out of it, if not all, most of the things or most of the problems are due to certain people which are not in right places. So I feel it's more or less about right places, right people at right places not there. Uh, I eventually wonder, considering the Indian democracy and politics, will we ever be able to set it right? What's your take on this and what should be steps done to improve this? Yeah, big question. I mean, I, I don't have a take on it. I mean, I have a take on it. I haven't got an answer to it. I mean, see, democracy, as Churchill once said, is the worst of all political systems except for the rest. You know, so we, it's not as if democracy provides an answer to everything. And we know, as I said, that all of our political representatives have to have to face an electoral cycle every five years or you know and that their constituencies are huge and it costs a lot of money to fight elections and so on and so forth so there is this uh, very short-term approach to decision making in in the government amongst the politicians they're focused on how they're going to generate the success their next success their next political success this clashes with the fact that all of the problems, or many of the problems, actually all many of the problems that India faces cannot be addressed if you take a short-term view. They can only be addressed if you take a statesman-like, sustainable view, a long-term view. So, how do you address this challenge? This challenge is through the public. Public opinion is now the fifth estate. The four estates are the judiciary, the executive, the legislature, and the media. Now public opinion is emerging as the fifth state. Public opinion is going to be the basis on which I think we begin to address some with there's abundant evidence of that now, with the corruption scandals that are that are evident every year, every day. That that so ultimately it's going to be the public that is going to I think solve this problem. I mean that said, let me just say one more thing from, from professional experience. As I said, 15 years in Shell, we have grown the business. And we've grown it without, uh, without uh, uh, breaching our principles and breaching my principles and my values. So, I couldn't have done it unless I was also talking to people who actually accepted what was good for the country. I can name you many, many people uh, from the IAS, from the political sector, who are actually very public spirited, and I was in. Uh, I was uh, asked uh, in uh, by. I was in some television program called The Big Fight. It was to do with the IAS, and someone in the audience asked me. Oh, no, I think uh, the anchor asked me. He said, "Would you?" Recommend uh, if that any of these people in the audience join the IAS because I had left the IAS. So I said, unhesitatingly, yes. But so long as their public service does not come at a personal price or at too high a personal price, that's the problem sometimes. But there are some fantastic people. The fact that you are here today has to mean that there were people in the government of Rajasthan that did what was right for Rajasthan, not just for you. You know? So, the answer is don't give up. The answer is do know what is right. <laughs> you, know, you have to know yourself what is right. If you compromise on your own values, if you compromise on your own principles, you are then moving in a direction where eventually you won't know, you won't know the difference between right and wrong. You won't know how far you are away from that line 
which divides the bending of a rule from the breaking of the rule. It's a very fine line, gentlemen, ladies. Okay, many of the people today who are in jail or many of the people who will go to jail they actually did not think that they were breaking that line, that they were crossing that line. They thought they were just bending the rule. They thought they were making, you know, they were exploiting the system. Now suddenly they're told, no, they've actually crossed the line, they've broken the law. But that happens when you already start on the wrong direction. And you start in the wrong direction when you basically start to compromise yourself and your own values. So my, again, back to my very simple thesis, you do the right thing, eventually we'll all do the right thing and then we will, as a country and as a society, actually move in that direction of sustainability that, as I say, is, is crucial. I think that uh, my own view uh, is that climate change is a very serious uh, threat, that the debate on, on, on this issue should end. We should no longer be quibbling about, we should not be debating you know, the numbers, whether the temperature will go up by 2% or 2.5%. We should just simply recognize that the way that man has progressed and industrialized has led to a complete imbalance in, as I say, the relationship between development and nature, and that the world is warming and we're coming very close to the brink. So the second point is that we have to do something about it. Everyone has to do something about it. My, and whether it's to invest in clean energy, whether it's to do what you're doing in your own small way, uh, whether it is to uh, uh, impose uh, targets on how you are going to shift from fossil fuels to renewables, especially for power generation. Because power is one of the biggest emitters of greenhouse gas. Uh, so there are many, many solutions, by the way, uh, on how you can try and reduce emission stand emissions. The big, uh, uh, the big question really is whether or not you have a sense of urgency about it. Because today in America, if you were to go to America um, and you moved out of New York City, you know, you'd be a highly unpopular person if you, if you said what I said just now. You know, there are still people there who think that climate change is the biggest hoax that was perpetrated on mankind. <laughs> okay? So, so there you have it. You haven't got an energy policy in America. You don't have an energy policy. You have uh, a situation where uh, White House, this is under Obama, okay? A man who is more liberal and more thoughtful about this than any of his predecessors, or many of his predecessors, where the energy, the economic person in the White House called, I know this for a fact, called somebody uh, who is an energy specialist and asked them, uh, and, and, and this man went to White House thinking that he was going to be asked about energy and how to actually address the question you've just asked. You know what he got? He, this woman, it was a woman, she in White House, senior, very senior person, she produced a list of the representatives in Congress, that is like our Lok Sabha, okay? I mean, uh, and she went through each one of them and said, now this man, he comes from this state in America, this state has these coal mines, so his interest is in protecting this coal mine. This man, he comes from this state. This state has a large number of oil fields. So his interest is, is going to be to protect the oil fields. And he went around. And he discovered that basically America was never going to have an energy policy because America is run by vested interests. We think about ourselves? No. America, in America is divided. So this problem of climate change is not getting the due attention because it is impossible for countries to actually address this because of the division within their own country. China today has emerged as the largest emitter of greenhouse gases in the world. So I'm afraid it's a big, big concern.
there is a very interesting uh, and huge project called uh, Desert Tech in um, Africa, Saharan region. It's a, a huge project in which uh, solar energy would be produced in Sahara Desert and it would be trans transported to Europe and Middle Eastern countries. The project costs are uh, nearly 50 billion. What do you think? Uh, you know, do you think this project would be successful? Because you know, till 2030, this project needs to be completed partially. Given the economic turmoil today in the world, where the um, countries are unable to invest, they are in fact cutting the costs. So, what do you think? How much would it be successful? You know, I don't know about this project, and I don't want to uh, therefore comment on how whether it's going to be successful or not. But a more general point is that uh, solar, the technology for solar exists and the challenge really is to reduce the cost and every year uh, we are seeing the cost curve actually fall. So it is not going to be long in my view before solar becomes competitive against say gas. Okay. Um, I think we still need to, however, move to a second generation technology for solar. Today we are, it's on silicon, we have to really commercialize thin film. And thin film based solar, once it's commercialized, I think will actually lead to the competitiveness of solar against the alternatives. Now when that happens, then uh, certainly solar will, will acquire a very significant share of the non-transportation energy basket. Don't, uh, remember one thing that in, in the world today, 50% of all the energy is consumed by cars and motorcycles and a airplanes and so on. We have to find a, an alternative to that if we really want to make a dent in so far as the, in, far, in so far as clean energy is concerned. Solar and wind and, uh, and nuclear uh, and, and those three, they are going to hopefully reduce the share of fossil fuels that is being used by consumers that are stationary, like power plants. Large consumers, fertilizer plants, steel plants, but not necessarily you know, consumers that account for uh, the maximum consumption of energy. Huh? Okay. Oh, well, one more. Then, then, then okay. one more. Then. Uh, okay. I, I agree with everything you're saying, except uh, don't exaggerate the power of big companies, okay? I mean, just don't imagine that people listen always to people, you know, they listen, but they're not always going to do anything that I say or what, you know, any one of us says. It's, it's, it's the nature of government, the nature of governance anywhere in the world, but I agree with you, we have to do it. Companies like Shell are investing a lot of money, as I said earlier. But they're also in India, now let's focus on India. We are doing our best to influence uh, the government on, on uh, allocating, to allocate more money towards uh, 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 R&D, research and development, for matters related to carbon capture, you know, uh, carbon capture and sequestration, for example. Uh, and that is something that we need to do if we want to actually contain the emissions from our power plants. Because we are going to be dependent on coal. We don't have an alternative. So the issue really is how do we green coal? 
I've been to the government many times and talked about coal gasification, talked about coal to liquids, talked about carbon capture, talked about a pricing system that will incentivize investors to invest in these kind of technologies. You know? Ultimately, again, I go back, it's going to be all of us. It's going to be the public. It's going to be you. I mean, you make that point and ten of you make that point. The politicians may, may listen more than if they listen to me. They don't think that I have the power to change their political future, but you might. I mean, you meaning the voter, you know, the public. Thanks. I'm sure we have uh, many more questions, which you